Hi everybody, welcome back to today's class. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Gu again one more time. In um, today's lecture, we're going to go continue the journey about chain confirmation. In the last few lectures, I hope you already learned about all these concepts related to different chain model, different uh, uh, parameter to quantify the chain rigidity, either using the free joint chain model, um, uh, using the characteristic ratio, or the um, Kuhn lens, or also called persistence lens. And as we discussed in the previous several lectures, uh, persistence lens is very useful to understand how rigid polymers are, and it, it is very important in several regards that will help you to confer if the chain is rigid or not. So today's lecture, we actually will discuss how we actually can apply what we have learned in the past to something really useful. What specific I mean by something useful is to through the discussion about a parameter called uh, mm, uh, radi uh, radius of gyration. And um, what we're going to learn in today's lecture related to this radius gyration is about how we can predict the radius gyration and how we can measure the radius gyration. And uh, more importantly, how does radius gyration can be linked to what we have discussed in the chain confirmation. So I will start with my lecture by giving you the end results. So for um, for radius gyration, it is basically a very similar parameter to describe how big your polymer coils are. It's not a parameter to talk about rigidity, but it is a parameter to talk about um, how big your coil size. If you have um, if you have listened carefully in the past a few lectures, we already know that. The end-to-end uh, -end distance is a parameter we have discussed. So naturally, you sh should think about is radius gyration might be related to the end-to-end -end distance. The short answer is yes, they are very much related. And we're going to go through today's lecture to discuss how they are related and how do we treat those two parameters. And, and let me start the today's lecture by making a point that it's very nice you can understand the end-to-end -end distance. It requires only need to put the emphasis on the two chain ends. So one end, the other, then you can just measure the distance of it. If you have the Superman's ability, it's not a joke, but if you have the ability, you can throw the tie so the chain is frozen, and you can be a nanoscale man, and you can put the ruler on the two ends. Then you can measure the end-to-end -end distance easily, right? It's like the a microscopic object, as I show. For example, a, a coil or a power strip. So you can measure those um, strips end and measure what's the distance by using a ruler. It is not that simple. Uh, in principle, this is a feasible and can be done, but it is very tedious, and nobody in polymer science would do that in the modern way. Um, secondly, as you know, there are some of the polymer are linear chains, but polymer has other architectures can come into play. For example, you could have polymers would have adopted a, a star-shaped, star-like shaped polymer, or a brush polymer, or comb-like um, structure. So all kind of those different structures would result in a different expression of end-to-end -end distance, right? If you have multiple chain and how do you approach this? So naturally, people start to think about an alternative method to quantify this end-to-end um, -end distance that is basically the radius gyration what we're gonna talk about. And before we go through different slides, I wanna also mention it is a parameter is very much related to different scattering technique. Our group specializes in this technique and I won't talk in more detail because uh, either you can take Dr. Yung Simon's class next semester or I will offer advanced 800 level elective class you can take that. But light scattering or those scattering technique directly probes the radius of gyration so you can basically measure that 
you can throw in different molecular way and put in a tool you can measure and claim what the radius gyration of your polymer is if you can measure different molecular weight of your material you can actually plot out different radius of gyration with respect to different molecular weight by understanding how fast your slope or increase of uh, radius of gyration or end-to-end -end distance you can understand if your material is rigid or soft or or is swelled or in ideal solution or so all these calculations can be done and in real experiment um, you are doing similar similar method and doing a similar way you basically extract those values and uh, um, measure a different molecular weight and indeed plot them out so let's go through a little bit of more detailed explanation about what is radius gyration, their definition and their physical meaning, and we're also going to talk about how does this radius gyration can be linked to end-to-end -end distance. Um, I would only introduce some simple math, but not going to go into a lot of long equations. Again, uh, if you're interested in long equation, we have already a recorded lecture last year. Uh, feel free to click on the link and then dive deep into how we link these two. All right. So we already discussed all of these. Um, so this is the way we have already mentioned. The, the end-to-end -end distance is shown in here. Root mean square of end-to-end -end distance is where we have been talked about in great extents and in great depths in the first uh, four or five lectures. So end-to-end -end distance is a parameter to tell you how big your polymer coil is. And we have a quiz on that. Everybody should know by now for given molecular weight and um, you know if you adopt a free joint chain model how relatively size is, right? And it is hard to measure, so um, additionally, if you have a structure with multiple chain or other uh, monomers uh, with more different or exotic different uh, end groups then they would behave quite differently so naturally people think about how people can get a better way to quantify it so this slide shows you guys what is the first uh, definition of radius gyration and it's basically is average distance of each monomer unit from the center mass of the chain so let's first define what the center of mass so if you calculate out from each point and take a weight average and find its center, it's called weight center. So quite simple, it's represented for these red dots. So this is a center of the weight. So if you think about Earth, that will be where the core of the Earth. Or think about my pan, center of the weight will be roughly in the middle of the pan where it will be. So it's clear, see the darker ground. If I have remote control, that will be roughly in the center of the remote. Okay, quite straightforward, right? And uh, the other is, it says average distance each monomer to the center of mass of chain. So we need to weight every single monomer to count what the distance from end group to the center. And uh, at the first glance, you may not get it. How does this radius of gyration can be linked to end-to-end -end distance because end-to-end -end distance you talk about these two dots the distance but this would be the average of this and naturally um, I would feel the same way they may not be linked but throughout today's lecture we'll learn that they are actually linked and they're very closely related rg square will be one six of r square so Remember, this is not end-to-end -end distance, but this is, uh, this is not end-to-end -end distance. This is end-to-end -end distance square. So if you want to get end-to-end -end distance, you just need to take your root square. So this is roughly end-to-end -end distance divided by 2.4 uh, because uh, root 6 is very close to that. And that means your real value of the RG will be smaller than end-to-end -end distance by roughly 2.4, a factor of 2.4, okay? And the definition of RG radius gyration is given by here. RG square will be equals to I divided by N. M is mass of the body 
This is moment of inertia. This would be classic uh, physics definition if you take a mechanics or physics class that what people will give you. But for our polymer, we basically only need to consider that center of the mass because we assume each dot would take the same amount of weight. In other words, they're all carbon, so they don't make a difference. In that scenario, your RG square will be just equal to sum. Remember, this is a sum sign. Mass multiplied by R square. That's basically is the momentum of inertia. That's the definition. It defines by um, this term, and then center of mass is basically sum of all the mass together. If you take an average in the in the in the in our uh, polymer field, because those uh, sum of m term will cancel each other, so slightly different, as I mentioned again, than the physics community, because we only need to consider number averaged ri. Ri is basically a distance from point of center to wherever the bond, okay? So if we say this is element i, ri is basically, let me show you, so this will be the vector ri from the center to the side will be the vector ri, okay? So with all these considered, we now know that um, radius of gyration can be simplified just a number average, one divided by n, because there's n different um, center to each element, and the average distance will be ri square, right? So this thing is complicated, but uh, again, like at the beginning I mentioned, they are very much close to be linked to end-to-end -end distance. And you might be confused how this black line can be linked to this red line. Very simple. Simple um, triangle mass um, relationship. So if you have a triangle, the bond three, we can label them as A, B, C. Let me see. I need to find that somewhere has more empty space. Okay, here is a good one. Let's go back. So let's call it uh, this particular square. Let me reproduce this. Okay, so I'm showing those three particular lines now uh, repeated again in, in the top. So you know what to get ABC. ABC is just a, a scalar, so how long they, these are. So and you can get a theta, so ABC can be related. In other words, uh, we can get A squared plus B squared plus 2AB cosine theta would be equals to C squared. Well, this is the just a uh, simple mass. Everybody should know this. And using this, we now can, would be able to link RI, RJ, this would be, sorry, this would be the vector we can call it Sij between the point i and point j, right? So using this, we can actually now have a way to convert the vector between the center of mass to the vector related to something really sitting on the polymer bones or polymer chain, or backbone, right? And that's the most difficult part, is whoever thought about um, the radius generation is very smart, very clever, can really figure this out in the first place. So it's benefited us, because now we can simply get the conclusion here. If you are interested in the detailed mass, um, very simple, I can discuss how People would do it. So in first place, the average term of 2AB cosine theta, this term would be equal to zero. In other words, we would be able to convert this to C square minus A square minus B square. And because of AB are already defined here as RI, RJ, we can basically replace those two terms into the A, B, and get the S, I, J. I won't go into too much detail. Um, 
in a simple sense, let me get this one. In a, in a simple sense, that um, this would allow you to get another relationship would be Rg squared would be equals to 2n squared divided by 1. I equals to 1 to n, j equals to 1 to n, and Rij squared, okay? And Rij is basically the distance between a bond I and J, so we can further simplify that to be another term, Rij vector square, okay, and to end distance, we know that for each bond will be nl square. So n is the number of bonds in between. I minus j is basically what's a bond in between these two segments. So if we go up, if we we have if we take three bonds, this will be R2, this will be R5. That means there are three bonds in between. 5 minus 2 is 3. So end to end distance. For this, we'll follow a Gaussian chain, which is um, 3 um, d squared. So this is basically generalized in, in, in what in this very simple equation. This is basically says r squared will be mb squared. n is now defined by absolute i minus j. Uh, knowing this, we can further apply. Um, some additional mass, and then quickly, quickly convert this Rg square would be equals to 6mb square. If you do a sum of this, then this will tell you Rg would be equals to R0 power a square, sorry, divided by 6. So they are related, and they are smaller by just a simply a factor of roughly six. So that's how you can powerfully use this light scattering to quantify Rg and link the radius of gyration Rg back to your end-to-end -end distance. It's quite simple and quite nice. So in the, in the science community, we use this radius gyration a lot. And almost all the exercise you're going to do, um, we'll talk about radius of gyration, how we measure them. And for different objects, we have different radius of gyration. So for Gaussian coil is what we have discussed. Uh, Rg square will be mb square. N is number of uh, um, uh, Kuhn monomer is b, and N is degree of polymerization. Okay? Oh. Or you can look at what is Gaussian star, Gauss, uh, a Gaussian ring, all kind of different structures. But I don't want to point you to attention that same rods. The rods will have a, a quite interesting end-to-end, -end, uh, not end-to-end -end distance, but radius of gyration about L squared divided by 12. And this we're going to assign as one of the homework as we, are, as we would see in the later session of the lecture. So this pretty much summarizes what is radius gyration. So I'm looking forward to discuss with everybody what, what's your understanding of radius gyrations are and how we can use radius gyration to better understanding chain conformation. So with that, uh, we can quickly wrap up uh, this short session and we will come back again in the next session. Um, we can talk about uh, another thing is in the textbook, they discussed one great example related to how we can use radius gyration and understand what is um, the characteristic ratio. So if you can turn the textbook to page 232, there's example 6.3. This is a very good example. I'm going to go through quickly with everybody. So this question asks us, uh, use experimental data for Rg of polystyrene dissolved in cyclohexane showing figure 6.9 and to estimate, estimate C infinity, um, characteristic ratio basically, persistence lens, and statistical segment lens. So how can we address this? 
is basically tell you Rg would be equals to 0 0.25 molecular weight power of 0 0.5. It is done by measure six different molecular weight as shown in there. They would measure molecular weight very low to increase the molecular weight by a little bit, then continue increase it. And they can measure Rg by light scattering. Once you give the both information, you can basically um, assume a molecular weight. In this case, in the textbook, they assume n would be equal to power of the uh, zero power of five. And this is universal, right? Since this equation is not limited to one molecular weight, so you can assume a molecular weight. If you apply this, then you can get the molecular weight. Um, degree of polymerization is power of 10 to the 5. Sorry, it's not molecular weight. This was uh, a wrong indication. Um, so if you have a molecular weight is um, about 10 to the power of 7, so 10 million. You have degree of polymerization about 10 to the power of 5. Then you can get the radius gyration using the uh, equation above. So Rg would be equals to 0 0.25 multiply uh, 10 to the power of 7, power of 0 0.51. So you can get what is radius of gyration. And you can also calculate out number of bonds. And polystyrene is similar to polyethylene. There's two bonds per backbone. So number of bonds will be twice of what is degree of polymerization. So 2 multiplied by 10 to the power of 5. And then you can simply use um, what we know. What we measured is end-to-end -end distance would be equals to six times of Rg square would be equals to end-to-end -end distance square. Then divide by free joint chain model, which is NL square. Uh, pay attention what N is. Remember, this is different with degree of polymerization. You will be able to get a characteristic ratio for polystyrene. As you in the textbook, it is about 11.5. So uh, that's how you get the, what is a characteristic ratio. And using that, you can easily get persistence lens because it's just a characteristic ratio divided by two, then multiplied by a single bond. So that will be equals to 11.5 divided by two and multiplied by 1.54 equals to 8.8 and .8, um, So roughly it takes about um, five or six bonds for the change to turn uh, 90 degree. So polystyrene is not very rigid. And you can also get uh, statistical segments, which is show in, um, showing the equation above, B would equal to root six divided by root N multiplied by RG, and that will give you um, what is, uh, uh, I think the textbook missed, uh, uh, Okay, no, it, that's right. That's right, it didn't miss anything. So that's right. So if you take the apply all the value in there, root six divided by root square of 10 to the power of fifths multiplied by 948, you would get what the B or statistical segment, okay? So this can be used in experimentally. So assume you're gonna work on similar project in future you can make a new polymer, brand new, nobody knows what it is, so you need to understand how they behave in solution, you will do the same. Synthesize three, four different molecular way, dissolve in a decent solution, and then do light scattering. So based on the data, you can calculate out their rigidity, chain statistical segments. If you're shooting for rigid chain, you should expect a high RG dependence on molecular way. Okay, with that, I'm gonna answer more questions in classroom and uh, um, that that will be it. In the next class, we're going to discuss about um, a, a very simple title called sphere rods and coil, as well as distribution of end-to-end -end distance. So uh, we will come back in, in next week and discuss those concepts.